Have you ever noticed how sometimes just seeing this word can give you a warm feeling inside? Not so much a word then, more a feeling invoked by a thought. Or is it a thought invoked by a feeling? The answer, of course, is both. I thought of my loved one, and it made me feel happy. I woke feeling happy, and I thought to myself, I'm going to share this feeling with my friend. I'm going to take her and the kids to the park and buy them all ice creams. After all, they've had a rough time recently. All that debt, all that work, those sleepless nights, the grind of the office, the factory floor, the staff common room, where somehow we all seem to be in competition with one another. Why is that anyway? And yes, in case you'd forgotten, your retirement age has just gone up another two years to 69. And no, you can't buy that dream house. Unless, of course, you both go out to work. And that'll mean childcare. Now that'll cost you. So how are you doing? You been anywhere nice? I haven't seen you on Facebook recently. We've just booked our holiday. I'm so excited. To be honest, between you and me, we had a terrible time in Lanzarote last year. We rowed all the time. The kids got sick. But this year, it's going to be fab. Thoughts of happiness. Feelings of being happy. Minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, and yes, year by year. But what is it that really makes us happy? And why does our economy and our society not put happiness first? Why is it so often a byproduct of what we do and not the main driver of what we do? Why isn't happiness our main goal when it takes up so much of our thoughts, our feelings, our dreams, our conversations? And what would we have to do to make it our main goal, our main ambition as a community, as a society, as custodians of this planet? Perhaps more to the point, what would our politicians have to do? Or our employers? Of course, some of them are already doing it very nicely. <laughs> very nicely indeed. <laughs> or the 1% of the world population who have 50% of the wealth. 50%. And who somehow seem to have made claim to most of the world's supposedly common assets. Apparently, they're not common at all anymore. We have to pay over and over and over again for things that actually shouldn't really belong to anyone. Are you happy about that? What about you? Are you happy? Not at all. Oh, what about you, sir? Are you happy? Yes, yes, Daniel, you. <laughs> yes. Oh, I, I slipped up, I should have brought him to the rehearsals. I don't think we're happy about it at all. Not really. So I could very well have started this lecture by saying, good evening, thanks for coming, and then maybe made a joke about the free drinks. But I knew deep down you were eager to know why the economist from the CCRI was talking about happiness and not the price of land or, I don't know, the law of diminishing returns 
in the market for wheat. Or, if you've known me for long enough, and fortunately for me, some of you have, the economic functions of market towns in the rural economy. Which, of course, is where it all started for me. I was fortunate enough to do both my degrees in this fabulous place, the Seelhane Faculty of the University of Plymouth. And it was a place where I caught a bug, a bug that would stay with me for the rest of my life. The research bug. And like many rural economists, I then ended up spending some time in Aberdeen, where the opportunity to work on a European project afforded me three brilliant years north of the border. Where I made some friends for life. Some of them might even be here. I don't know. Yes, they are. Indeed. And I had a lot of fun exploring some of Scotland's remotest communities. Finding out what it was that made them tick. What gave their inhabitants a good quality of life? What it was that made them happy? The project was called The Dynamics of Rural Areas, affectionately known as DORA. And these were the case study areas. And if you've never been to the Orkney Islands, I would strongly advise that you put it on your bucket list. Now, the research question was all about why some apparently similar, area, similar areas, in terms of things like their geography or their policy, performed quite differently economically. And what I learned was that you can't really look at the economy in, our, in isolation from any other aspect of our lives. Actually, when you look at the economy and society together, a bit of magic happens. It affords a lot of understanding about why we do what we do and how we can improve our lives and actually make ourselves happier. And I also found out that we can learn a lot from taking a different perspective on things. And actually how it becomes possible to study something much more meaningful if we look at things from a different angle, from a different perspective. If we use a different lens. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. The merits of looking at the economy and the society together, of looking at them through the same lens, but also looking at them through an alternative lens, a lens which I call the happiness lens. So what I want to do is I want to look at these three concepts from a socioeconomic perspective. And I'm going to be spending most of the lecture filling in the six blank cells of this table. Now, I'm going to be quizzing you about what words we should put in those cells. What are the best words? To populate them. So you're going to have to listen. Did you hear that, Mum? <laughs> you're going to have to listen. I'm very fortunate, ladies and gentlemen, to have my mum and dad in the audience uh, who are here to find out finally what it is <laughs> that I actually do. <laughs> At the moment, they only know one thing, that I don't really work for a living. <laughs> Okay, to achieve that, I wonder, what I want to do is basically tell you three things. And if you remember anything at all from this lecture, just try and remember these three things. Firstly, I'm going to explain why I think the economy is the right vehicle through which a lot of our current problems as a species and as custodians of our planet can be addressed. Now, that, of course, includes the environment, but a focus on environmental problems often means, actually, that we neglect ourselves. We neglect our society. And I think, actually, if we put that right, a lot of things can fall into place for us. Secondly, I'm going to suggest that by making happiness our main goal, instead of economic growth, could just be the answer that we're searching for. And thirdly, I'll be explaining why economists need to start understanding our thoughts and our feelings, as well as our behaviour. Economists usually are only interested in our behaviour. Actually, if you look at it, they're usually only interested in our behaviour on the high street. That's the main thing they're interested in. 
So psychology has a, an important role to play in that as well. So how are you going to spend the next hour of your life? First thing, I'm going to tell you the story of impact. And this is all about social value and social return. And I'm going to be introducing this tool that Stephen mentioned, the social return on investment. And then I'm going to be telling you what it is that makes you happy. So even if you don't leave this room feeling happy, hopefully you will know what it is you have to do when you leave this room to go and make yourself happy. And finally, I'm going to suggest a few ways that we might reconsider what it is we mean by value and introduce this idea of the integrative economy. And then very briefly, very briefly indeed, at the end, I'm just going to outline a few shifts that we can start to make to move in a direction from, social, from conventional economics to socioeconomics, to try and break down some of the boundaries that I think that are imposed by conventional economic thinking. So let's get straight on then. Social value and social return. Now the backdrop to this, you'll be pleased to hear, was a piece of government legislation. And that legislation was called the Social Value Act of 2012. Uh, the first I heard of it was probably, I don't know, 2010 maybe, 2009, 2010. So there was a bit of momentum in the build up to it, like there so often is. And what the Social Value Act did was it meant what it tried to do, and what it does actually, is that it meant that public authorities had to have regard to the economic, social and environmental well-being in connection with public service contracts and for connected purposes. <clears throat> so, for example, the City Council, the NHS Trust, uh, the Housing Association, the Fire Rescue Service, organisations like that, they had to try and make sure that the services they provide or that they procure, in some way would lead to improvements in well-being in its broadest sense. So, for example, the health service might try and employ those with a history of mental health, deliberately. Or the housing association might try and promote careers through local schools, so there's some kind of local impact. Now, at this stage, when I was writing this lecture, I got to about this stage, and I was actually going to give you quite an in-depth tour of this piece of legislation. But I thought, is this really the best way to spend a summer's evening? So I thought, on that, I thought, do you know what, Paul? The delete button is actually going to serve us all well, <laughs> as it so often does. <laughs> so I just want to tell you one thing, just one thing about the Social Value Act, because I think it says a lot. I want to tell you the difference between how the government defines social value and how it's been interpreted and picked up and used by the community and voluntary sector. <clears throat> how does our friend George define social value? According to George Osborne, social value is a way of thinking about how scarce resources are allocated and used. Now, I couldn't believe that when I read that definition because... Really, it could have come straight out of an economics textbook. You go as far as doing something quite bold and something quite radical to try and deliver social value to society in a different way, and yet you start harping back to scarce resources. Now, NAVCA, on the other hand, so this is the National Association for Voluntary Community Action, they say, well, actually, social value, social value encourages us to have a more broader, holistic approach to work with communities and users of services to find better ways to meet their needs and spend public money. So they've really embraced it and looked at it as something positive, something that they could really do something with and try to embed it into what they're doing day to day, <clears throat> into how they're delivering things and actually what, they're, what it is they're delivering. So I'm going to tell you uh, a bit more about social value. Firstly, I'm going to tell you a bit about the methods uh, that I've been using to assess social value in the community and voluntary sector. And then I'm going to present findings from two projects. Uh, and the first one, the first project really to land on the CCRI desk under the umbrella of social value, was a project called Proving Our Value, and this was commissioned by Southwest Forum, uh, which is an umbrella organisation ser serving the Southwest region. Now, they managed the project, they commissioned it, but it was funded through the big lottery, and it was one of five, we were one of five sister projects right the way across the region. 
Now, the, the basic aims of proving our value were well, the two aims. Firstly, it was trying to evidence impact of the voluntary and community sector. And secondly, it was trying to develop tools to allow, in our case anyway, smaller organisations to actually measure their own value and evidence their own impact. Now, there were two great things about proving our value. Firstly, it was an action research project. So we weren't just studying things, we were trying to make things happen, which is un unusual in research, but it, it's really good. And in the words of my colleague and mentor, Malcolm Mosley, I'm not sure if he's here or not. Oh, he's here. In the words of my colleague and mentor, Malcolm Mosley, what we were trying to do was throw a pebble in the pool and study the ripples. We were trying to make things happen. We, we kind of viewed the project, actually, as a, as a form of community development. And I think, to an extent, I think it was. The second great thing about it was that there were, because there were five sister projects, that meant that the researchers got an opportunity to meet and to share ideas, so we had these quarterly meetings. Um, and that's exactly what we did. And that's where I came across uh, this tool called Social Return on Investment. That's where I really started to get interested in it. And I, I started to think, well, could I take this tool and use it in proving our value? And maybe if it works, and I could then add it to the kind of toolkit that CCRI uses for policy evaluation. So what is social return on investment? Now, I always say to people, the hardest thing about social return on investment is saying the acronym. Because you want to say SROI, and what you have to say is SROI. And you can practice that later <laughs> over the wine. What social return on investment tries to do uh, or SRI tries to do is look at the broader concept of value. It tries to be relevant to the people and the organisations that you're using it for. Um, and the great thing about it, it's quite flexible, so it allows you to encompass social, economic and environmental impacts all within one framework. So if you've got a project and you're worried about the impacts on inequality, on environmental degradation, on well-being, all at the same time, then it's, it's a great tool to at least have a go with. But what I really liked about it, actually, was that SROI focuses on outcomes and not outputs. So often in policy evaluation, policymakers ask us to come up with lists of outputs. So very simply, an output could be the numbers of people that attend a parish council meeting. Just the number. Tick a box. But what SRI says is, hang on a minute, I don't, we don't really care how many people go to that meeting. What matters is what happens to the lives of those people when they go to the meeting. So for, it might reduce their social isolation. They might start making friends in their village. They might start trusting people in their local community more as a result. And that's quite a significant outcome. <clears throat> and that's the spirit of SROI. Another thing I liked about it was that it's driven by stakeholders. Economists are notorious for sitting in dark rooms coming up with numbers. But in SRI, you're out there, you're, you're identifying your outcomes through talking to people, through interviewing them, through storyboard workshops, through conversations at the end of the day. And what you try and do is you, you try and identify the outcomes of a project, and then you try and identify how one outcome might lead to another, might lead to another, might lead to another. And that is the first stage of an SRI. <clears throat> Sounds rather grand. You conduct a theory of change. Yes, I've done a theory of change. I've identified your outcomes. It's not as grand as it sounds, but it's really useful. Really useful. The next stage, you try and put numbers against those outcomes. You try and measure them. You might do it using surveys. But ultimately, you have to come up with a change in the outcome from zero to one and put it in a spreadsheet. It can be quite a challenge. And the third stage, you have to put, which is even more contentious, really, you have to try and put a pound sign in front of that outcome. You have to say, well, how much is that the change in the outcome worth to society and the state? So you have to monetize it. OK, so this is just an example of a theory of change for a project, one of the first projects we used in proving our value. It was all about the redevelopment of a bowling green as a youth facility. So there's this disused bowling green in Gloucester, 
and they were the city centre partnership who I was working with, they were trying to get kids off the streets because they were hanging around in the city centre being a nuisance. They were causing fear of crime. They weren't actually causing crime, but they were causing fear of it. <clears throat> so I did a theory of change. I interviewed quite a few people. I interviewed a few of the police officers. And I actually went on the beat with them. We walked around and you know, we looked at the various problems and so on. Anyway, I recorded it in a, in a normal way I would an interview. And I started to map out what the outcomes of this project were. And I came up with a list of final outcomes. Um, you probably, well, don't try and read it because the text is too small. But some of the, on the right-hand side, the outcomes were actually quite important outcomes. Improved mental health. Reduction in crime levels. Reduction in alcohol abuse. And that was just from one small project. I didn't take that any further. I kind of used that, really, as a test bed to see whether SRI was going to work or not. And I thought, yeah, we should use it. We should really make it part of our the main tool that we use in proving our value. So later on in the project, we, uh, we designed this tool uh, that was designed for smaller organizations called the SRA tool, Social Return Assessment. And we did it on a project called Fielding and Platt. And Fielding and Platt was all about this engineering works in Gloucester that had closed down in, in the 70s. Uh, <clears throat> and it was a really high profile business. It employed hundreds of people, and it designed and manufactured parts for Concorde, for example. And everyone knew about it. If you, if you didn't work at Fielding and Platt, chances are you knew somebody quite well who did. So it was a real network thing. And of course, when the Heritage Lot Lottery funded this project, a lot of these people that were living in Gloucester in the 70s were living all over the world. So what they did was set up this website where they could track people, but also start introducing people to one another again. So we did a theory of change, and these are the outcomes that came out. As you can see, they're all about subjective well-being, resilience and self-esteem, trust and belonging, supportive relationships, competence, engagement, and purpose. They were the, the, the principal outcomes. So our next task, really, was to try and find a way of putting numbers against those things. How, can you, how on earth can you measure change in resilience and self-esteem? Well, fortunately you can. There are a lot of tools out there. So one of them is the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale. And this is a questionnaire, which is similar to if you go to the doctors with a mental health issue, they ask you to fill out a questionnaire, and it's kind of similar to that. So it, and it has been rolled out in the NHS. There are other tools that um, the New Economic Foundation have created called the National Accounts of Wellbeing, and that kind of dovetails with the European Social Survey. And there, there's questions in there that actually give you a menu of questions for each of these outcomes. So we used some of those. We did some surveys. We used SurveyMonkey. They held events all over the city, uh, around, about, around Fielding and Platt, got people to fill in questionnaires around these outcomes. The next thing was that we had to put a pound sign in front of this, these outcomes. And this we found, well, we, with the City Centre Partnership, we really found it quite a difficult thing for the organisation to do themselves. So I kind of did this by myself, really. <clears throat> so you might say, well, how on earth do we cost or monetize a really woolly, fuzzy, subjective outcome like resilience and self-esteem? Well, you can use something like the unit cost of cognitive behavioural therapy, or CBT. So if you, if you go to the doctors suffering lower self-esteem, and the doctor says, well, what you need is some CBT. That will cost society around £1,240. So using the, making the assumption that having CBT to address your self-esteem would, would give you a broadly similar set of outcomes to getting involved in the Fielding and Platt project, then you can use that as a way of monetizing the change in resilience and self-esteem. That's the basic theory behind monetization. OK, now in SRI, you have to come up with a benefit to investment ratio, which is very often what everyone's interested in. What's the ratio? What's the ratio? Well, the way you do it is that you tally up all the inputs to start with. So how much has been invested in Fielding and Platt? Well, there was a Heritage Lottery grant of around 40 grand. But it doesn't just take hard cash. SRI, you capture 
you try and capture all types of investment, in-kind contributions, and you actually uh, value people's time as well, their voluntary time, and put that all into the model. So the actual investment was nearer 100,000. Now, I then had to tally up all those monetized outcomes in the spreadsheet, um, tally them all up, and then I had to take into account things like the effects of inflation. So I had to, in the same way as you would in a normal kind of discounted cash flow analysis, account for inflation in the model, and then take into account things like, well, what would have happened anyway without Fielding and Platt? We might have had an improvement in our self-esteem without it. Take into account what would have happened anyway, and also, how much could we really, of that change we've identified, how much could we really attribute to Fielding and Platt and not something else I was doing at the same time. Factor all that in, and it gave a benefit to investment ratio of 1.48 to 1. So every pound invested in Fielding and Platt gener generated a total of £1.48 for society in the state. I'm going to move on and tell you about another project. This was also funded by the lottery. And this was called the Local Food Programme, a really big project all over the country. Now, my esteemed colleagues, James Kerwin, hand please, thank you, Brian Elbury, thank you, sir. I don't think Damien's here yet, He's on the motorway or something. <clears throat> They'd already been doing an evaluation of the local food programme since 2009, right at the very start of it. The commissioners of the programme, the Royal Society for Wildlife Trust, they quite astutely said, we want an evaluation to run all the way through it, right from the start. And the local food programme, what it tried to do was to make locally grown food accessible and affordable to communities. So it was things like allotments, community farms, artisan bakeries, and a lot of growing projects in schools, getting kids familiar with local food, how to grow it, also teaching them where food comes from, because that's something that we've really lost sight of. So it was trying to do these things, but in a way, it was food being used as a vehicle for wider community development. So their evaluation identified three types of project, community project, education, and enterprise. So for the SRI, I selected Growing Greenwich down in London for the community, Get Growing, which is a project local to here, so that was a project in a school near Stroud, and the enterprise project was up in Cumbria called Growing Well. Now, this was really interesting. This was basically a farm that had been turned into a social enterprise. And people were going there to get training on all sorts of things, horticulture and agriculture and all sorts of things, obviously. <clears throat> but actually what was happening was that GPs were prescribing people to go and work on this farm as part of their mental health treatment. Really interesting project. So, cutting to the chase... Every pound invested in local food, the SRI model showed it generated a total of seven pounds for society in the state. It's a 700% investment, return on investment. But you might ask yourself, well, where, how is that value made up? And of course, the commissioners, the Royal Society of Wildlife Trust, who wanted a metric to go alongside this really rich, qualitative data set that they had from James and Brian and, and Dan and people, they want to say, well, how is that seven pounds made up? Well, 2% of it was around food affordability. Training and education, around about 8% of the seven pounds. Community vibrancy, yeah, it really got the community working together, around about a quarter. But the biggest impacts that the local food program seemingly had had was again all around subjective well-being. Physical health, obviously people are eating more fruit and veg, they're outside, working on allotments, all sorts of things. But also mental health and well-being, coming in at just under 40% of that seven pounds. So, this is where my mum's starting to look quite worried. We're now going to fill in the top two cells. Don't worry, mum, I won't ask you. <clears throat> top two cells of the table. We make a, a shift from looking at outputs towards outcomes. Okay, so after I'd done these two projects, I got in quite a reflective mood. I was reflecting on SROI as a, as a tool, as a research tool, evaluation tool, 
as part of the CCRI toolkit, actually, by this point, we'd done an SRI of the, of the Rural Development Programme, Axis 1 and 3 of the Rural Development Programme. There's another one just getting underway, another kind of food programme called Master Gardeners. So I reflected on it as a tool, but I also was reflecting on what the findings were telling me. And there were two things that came out. Firstly, was that the stakeholders, basically what it seemed to me, were saying that well, voluntary and community activities are making people happier. A lot of it was coming out all around subjective well-being, from asking the stakeholders, from literally just getting out there and asking them questions. So what I've been doing was I've been asking people to give me hedonic accounts, which is kind of like moment-by-moment -moment happiness based on how we feel. And I've been asking them for evaluative accounts. I've been asking them to kind of take a broader assessment of their life based on how they think and how they feel. And that really, I felt, was the, the kind of underlying spirit of SRI, which is summed up quite well, I think, by this quote. Now, this is from Robert Kennedy. Bear in mind, this is going back 40-odd years to the 60s. Too much and too long, we seem to have surrendered community excellence and community values in the mere accumulation of material things, our gross national product. Yet GMP doesn't allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education or the joy of their play. It measures neither our wit, our courage, neither our wisdom, nor our learning, neither our compassion. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. It's a powerful quote, isn't it? So, obviously I don't want to give you a really boring lecture about gross national product. Well, how is it made up? Well, well, blah, blah, blah. But let's just think about GMP. What GMP tries to do, it tries to be the main measure of success of our economy, our country ultimately, summed up in a number. But what it's measuring is basically the totality of all that human beings make and do for each other. But in GMP, should we really count things that we don't want to count? Should we count things like armaments and prisons? Should they be a part of our, a measure of our success? And what about things that are left out, but actually are really important, like our leisure time? Or more to the point, how our leisure time is actually spent? Because ultimately, that's what will make us happier. So those sort of things are left out. Now, there is a country in the world that does measure those things and does try to leave out the things that we shouldn't measure. And that's the Buddhist state of Bhutan. They actually ditched gross national product in the 1970s for a thing they call gross national happiness. And of course it's tied into their Buddhist philosophy and all the rest of it, but they feel that actually well-being is a more important goal than economic growth. So what can we learn from Bhutan? Well, actually, we don't have to learn anything from Bhutan. If we just go back to what we were doing, say, 100, 120 years ago, we can learn a lot. Now, back in the late 19th century, economists actually thought that happiness was the main measure of success, the main goal of our economy. I know, it's hard to believe, isn't it? But it's true. Economists at that time felt that we could compare one person's happiness with another's. And they also felt, even back then, that as a person got richer, the incremental effect on their happiness was likely to reduce. But then something happened, and it happened in the 1930s, and it didn't happen in economics. I know in the 1930s there was a massive depression. Wall Street crashed. There were all sorts of economic problems. It felt like the, the world was... The, the economy was collapsing, a bit like it felt about five, six years ago. <clears throat> but probably worse, actually. But where it happened was in psychology. What happened at this time was that there was an intellectual shift in psychology whereby psychologists who had been busy studying people's thoughts and their feelings all of a sudden said, actually, I think we should just study people's behaviour. I think we can learn a lot more from that. Let's, let's not bother worrying about how people are thinking, how they're feeling. Just look at what they do. And unfortunately, economics at that time followed suit. And with that, GMP got hijacked. Happiness came off the agenda. Economists now said that our preferences could only be inferred from our behaviour. 
ignoring how happy those preferences actually might make us feel. So GMP, the me main measure of our success in the economy, in society, was really, when it comes down to it, about income and consumption. And the trouble with coming up with a, a single measure like that is that a rise in income for some people almost always, even though the, the, the number hides it, almost always means a fall in income for somebody else. When you start looking at our economic system, it invariably means, it often means, that more for me is less for you. But there is some good news. In about 1960, 1960s, 70s, psychologists woke up. They said, do you know what? This study of behavior is getting us nowhere. Let's go back to what we were doing before. Let's get interested in, again in our people's thoughts, feelings. And there's some really, in the new psychology, there's some really interesting takes on it. There's things like interpersonal neurobiology, which is all about the relationship between the mind, the brain, and our social relationships. But the trouble is that economics is still stuck in this old behavioral paradigm. Economists just say it's the things that we derive utility from that drives our behavior. And actually, emotions are just a byproduct of that. But happily, the tide is starting to turn. Economists are starting to recognize the importance of happiness and the limitations of simply focusing on growth, utility, income, consumption, all the rubbish that we hear about on the TV and in the papers about the economy. That's rubbish in inverted commas. So that's really the, the topic of the next part of this lecture. I want to explore this concept of happiness in a bit more detail. I want to tell you what the economic interest in happiness is, what we can learn from it, how it might help us reconsider our economy, but actually how it might help us reconsider what we do with our own lives. So nothing too heavy. Now, when I first got into the uh, economics of happiness literature, I found two broad camps. Those aren't the broad camps, it's a bit misleading, but there are two broad camps. One is about the way that happiness can be used as a focus for reframing our economic thinking towards more sustainable and more meaningful activity. So if you Google economics of happiness, chances are you'll come up with some of this stuff. Now there's another camp which is actually being led by the mainstream economists. Now this is really quite high profile economists, um, people like Andrew Oswald from the University of Warwick, uh, people like Danny Blanchflower, who used to be on the, a member of the Monetary Policy Committee for the Bank of England, now spends pretty much all his time studying happiness, a lot of it in the States, a lot of it uh, using big surveys. Now, in the lecture, I'm kind of going to concentrate on the second one. I'm going to, I'm going to concentrate on the, the mainstream economists. And then later on in the lecture, I'm going to try and bring those two camps together because that hasn't really been done so well just yet. <clears throat> but firstly, I thought you might be interested in something from the first camp. Uh, and this is from a guy called Mark Anazeki, who's a Canadian. And he said, actually, you know, a lot of these terms that we use in economics are misunderstood. If we go back historically, they're being misused. So wealth, for example. Does anyone know what wealth really means? Abundance, that's pretty good. Well-being. Economics itself, we all know what economics means, don't we? What does it really mean if we go back, go back in time? He's good. Well, he wasn't great earlier, was he? <laughs> He's come up, come up with the goods at last. Household stewardship. It sounds weird, doesn't it? But actually, if you think about it, it sounds quite intuitive. Competition. What does competition mean? You won't get this. <laughs> you won't get it because it actually means the polar opposite of what we think it means. It means striving together. But my personal favorite, what does mortgage mean? I'm going to give you a clue, OK? Are there any French speakers in the audience? 
apart from you. <laughs> he speaks about 50 languages. Any ideas? I knew any French speakers would get this. My personal favourite is indeed mortgage. <laughs> Death pledge. So if you're about to sign on the dotted line, I would strongly advise that you think twice. We're going to have a bit of an interval now. And what I want you to do is to open those envelopes that you've been clutching. Not, not just yet, not just yet, not just yet. In a minute. In a minute, I want you to open those envelopes. <laughs> And have a go at answering the questions in there. And just see what you think. Try and be honest. There's an opportunity in there uh, as well to ask me some questions or to make some comments. Now, I'm not, not going to answer these questions tonight, but what I'm going to try and do is answer some of these questions on the CCRI blog over the next few weeks. So scribble away. Now, while you're doing that, I've got a bit of a treat for you. Um, I've got a, a film from... Uh, the Royal Society for Wildlife Trust very kindly let me use this film. And this was a film that was shown at the end of the local food programme celebration event. I said that too quickly, didn't I? Open the envelopes. Where I presented the findings from the SRI. I was fortunate enough to attend that. And they showed this film at the end. And I watched it and I thought, go in in my lecture. So enjoy that and I'll be back in approximately... Four minutes and 52 seconds. I just actually fulfilled a, a lifelong, lifelong ambition there by managing to get some dance music into one of my presentations. <laughs> so these are the questions you've been answering. How happy were you yesterday? Don't answer. That's from the Office for National Statistics. All things considered, how happy are you with your life as a whole nowadays? European Social Survey. Taking all things together, would you say that you are very happy, quite happy, not very happy, or not at all happy? The World Value Survey. So the point I was making really is that our politicians, our economists, world leaders... They're actually taking this stuff quite seriously. These surveys are massive, and they're costing a lot, and they're happening all over the world. They're, they're taking it seriously, but they're only taking it so far. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to present some findings from happiness economics, from that, uh, the mainstream economists, the second camp. And what they found, these people like Oswald and Blanche Flower, that, is that despite improvements in our health, our leisure time, our standard of living. Actually, we're no happier than we were 50 years ago. In fact, we're more miserable. So this is the relationship, and I appreciate you can't really see that top line, GDP per head, the relationship between GDP and happiness. One of the reasons why we're so miserable, one of the primary determinants they found of our happiness is our success relative to that of our peers, our friends, our family even. What we do as human beings, we tend to distort the picture of reality by unhelpful comparisons. It's deep-rooted in our psychology. We can't help it. And what the message from the economists, they say that what you should do in life is to get richer, get richer than your friends, but stay friends with them. Don't move your reference group upwards, because otherwise you'll start comparing yourself to them, and that'll make you depressed. Also, they say, don't use Facebook. <laughs> don't use it. Because what people tend to do on Facebook is they tend to portray an often false, positive image of their lives. And what does that do? It makes their friends feel miserable, depressed. So if you've got a Facebook account, close it. There's another problem which they found is the problem of adaption. And that is, very simply, as we earn more, we just spend more. And as a consequence, our expectations rise, we don't really get any happier. So refrain from that bigger house, that flashier car. Give some money to charity. Give it to me. 
looking at my dad again. <laughs> well, not again, he says. Put it in the bank. You'll be happier for it. Now, if you'd ever thought that life is a U-bend, then tonight, 18th of June, 2014, I can indeed confirm that life is a U-bend. Now, this is one of the strongest findings that the economists have found, is the relationship between our happiness and our age. So we start off 18, 19, you know, we're all quite optimistic about life. Yeah, we're going to change the world. Oh, it's going to be brilliant. And then we slowly slide down the U-bend until we get to around 44. <laughs> Somewhere around 44 to 46 uh, is where the global average of unhappiness bottoms out. And, of course, I know some of you know that I'm 44. <laughs> so I want to take this opportunity to apologise for being such a miserable sod for the last few years. It's not me, it's just my age. So apart from age, then, what else makes us happy? So this comes from Richard Layard's Top 7 Causes of Happiness. Family relationships. If you're married or you're cohabiting, you're likely to be substantially happier than if you were divorced or separated. Being in work, having a secure job. I think that's a lot about security. Feeling healthy. Now, this is an interesting one. This is a subjective assessment of health and not a medical assessment. So if we feel healthy, that's physical health and mental health. Personal freedom. That includes the quality of government. And I think, actually, if you... Think about that graph of GDP going up and up and up and happiness sort of, well, going down, basically. I think it's got something to do with it. I think there's a, there is a feeling of government increasingly impinging on our lives. Believing in God. Well, we all know that believing in God is good for the soul, but now the economists have confirmed it for us. Believing in God really does make, it, make us happy. They put it into their econometric models. Feeling part of a community. Now this, when you start reading into it, is all about trust. If we trust the people we live with, the people down the road, the people in our village, the people who run our local authority, people who run our country, if we trust them, we're going to be happier. And of course, that was what really came out strongly in the, the studies that I was doing of the voluntary and community sector. So here's my very brief summary. Happiness is not comparing our success with that of others. Not spending more as we earn more. Don't do it. I know it's hard. And this is another thing they found, which intrigued me. They found that we actually enjoy the anticipation of things more than we do the experience of them. So let's start enjoying the moments, not just the anticipation. So here's some more data. This is from Ipsos Mori. Now, uh, this graph shows the life satisfaction of women in the four-year lead-up to getting married, and the four years... <laughs> so, this is the big day. And then it starts to, uh, well, it starts to tail off a bit. Sort of go back to where you started from, really. Now, I'm a big fan of mixed methods. Um, so I have got some participant observation data, which I've triangulated with this quantitative data, and I can indeed confirm this graph to be broadly correct. <laughs> you can ask me later whether I got away with that. <clears throat> children. This is about the, our happiness and the age of our children. So there are four studies here. Again, this data comes from Ipsos Mori. So here we are. We start out married without children. Everything's rosy. And then it gets quite difficult, doesn't it? They sort of get three, four, five. Oh, God, it's difficult, isn't it? You know. It's a struggle. There's a bit of a bounce. Eight, nine, ten. Finally, they're doing what I tell them to do. Finally. And then it gets very dark. <laughs> very dark indeed. Apparently, between the ages of... When our children are between the age of 12 and 16, we are at our most miserable us parents. Now, I'm very happy to confirm that my daughter is turning 21. 
at the weekend. But it's only unfortunate for the illustration of this. Unfortunately, or fortunately, obviously, I also have a three and a half year old. So I've come from somewhere, ooh, that green line starting to go off into the stratosphere. Just about where that green line's touching the bottom. And this is my three and a half year old, William Courtney. Apparently, he uh, walked into his nursery the other day and proudly announced that his daddy was a professor. I said, not yet, he's not. He hasn't done his bloody inaugural lecture. <laughs> you might recognise the, the building there in the background, which is Seal Hain. A few years ago, the University of Plymouth sold Seal Hain. It's been bought by a charity called Dame Hannah's. They do some brilliant stuff there. And um, William absolutely loves it. There's a farm there and all sorts of stuff. Art studios, recording studios. Really good, so well worth a visit. A bit more data then. Uh, economists have amassed huge amounts of data about the relationship between our self-reported happiness and our air quality. So get out of the city, into the countryside, create more work for the CCRI. Also about what we eat. They've established links between the amount of fruit and veg we eat and our happiness as well. Eat your five a day. That's what they said. Gets to five a day, we're substantially happier. Okay, so why am I telling you all this? Apart from the fact that getting towards my mid-40s, I was so bloody depressed that I needed something more cheerful to study than rural policy. Apart from that, there are two important reasons. I'm going to deal with the first relatively quickly, but it is important. The first one is that I was interested in the validity of the self-reported measures that I've been using in these SRI studies. <clears throat> Could we really rely on them? After all, all you're doing is asking people a question like I asked you tonight. Are you telling me the truth? But apparently, so economists really jumped on this and they've amassed huge amounts of data again. And apparently, yes, we can rely on it. They verified this type of data through studies of cortisol levels in the brain, for example. So cortisol is a hormone that's released by the brain when it comes under stress. They've done all sorts of behavioral studies, so they've observed what people do as well as asked them. Not only of humans, but actually of great apes and chimpanzees. And interestingly, they found that great apes and chimpanzees have exactly, almost exactly the same U-bend in their life as we do. And this graph shows antidepressant use across Europe, again by age group. And as you can see, it's broadly the mirror image of that U-bend. So as a result, economists are really quite confident in that sort of data, increasingly confident. And of course, getting into that has also given me confidence in the self-reported data that I'm using increasingly. <clears throat> it's also confirmed my feeling that as a discipline, economics is in fact becoming more and more interdisciplinary and will continue to do so. And I think you know, we really need to embrace that and remember it. So on to the second reason then. And for that, I want to go back to this graph of GDP against happiness. Let's have a look at this graph. What is that graph saying to you? Well, to me, it's basically saying that our current economic system isn't really working. What is the point in all this economic growth if it's making us miserable? What's the point? We're getting material improvements in our quality of life, but it's not making us happier. We're running faster and faster, consciously and subconsciously, competing with each other, and it's making us less happy. So on that basis, I think something has to change. And remember also that this constant chase for economic growth is causing inequality, it's causing short-termism in decision-making, it's causing environmental degradation, and it's making things like tackling climate change all the more difficult. But why are our economists, our governments, hooked on economic growth? Well, one of the reasons is government debt. In very simple terms, the government needs inflation to reduce the real value of its debts. And for inflation, they need growth in the money supply. And to get growth in the money supply, you need economic growth. But of course, to keep growing, we need to keep bringing more and more into the realm of money. 
We need to make more and more things, as, in, turn more and more things into commodities that can be exchanged by using money. Because remember, the definition of economic growth is simply more and more being bought and sold. All the government actually want you to do is go to work and go shopping. That's it. Okay, so this chart so it shows government debt. Well, actually, it shows government get debt going back all the way to the mid-1700s. <clears throat> in, in 13 years, the previous administration managed to grow our country's national debt by more than any other government over the previous 300 years. And, of course, despite all the austerity measures that came in with the coalition in 2010, our debts continue to grow. For now, quantitative easing, or QE, is keeping the cost of these debts at sustainable levels. So newly printed money is basically used to buy government bonds, which keeps the price of the bonds up and the yields artificially low. Remember, it's the yield, which is basically the interest rate that the government pays on its debts. But this won't last forever. I mean, we've all heard in the last few days, actually, that interest rates are about to go up and all the rest of it. The reality is that interest rates probably won't climb that high because as they go up, the yield on government gilts will also go up and the government will start to struggle. <clears throat> so we may not be too far away from the next deflationary shock. Europe already looks to be heading into a deflationary spiral. They're already starting to embark finally on a, what will be a massive QE programme probably. And Japan has actually been in one for over two decades. The reason? Government debt. So it's debt, really, that has turned our governments into growth junkies. And as a result, we're all stuck in this rat race where everything's getting harder and harder and more and more competitive. We're running faster and faster and chasing this and chasing that and trying to keep up with the Joneses. Student debt, house prices, falling real wages, Growing polarisation of wealth. There's no need to rehearse any of those things here. And this quote from Wilkinson and Pickett, I think, I think it sums up quite a lot, actually. So, to address this, I think it's worth looking at the economy through a different lens. And what I propose is that we look at it through the happiness lens instead of the growth lens. After all, the growth lens, in many ways, is not getting us very far. So, the next two words in our table. These two are easy. We're going to make a shift from... You got it. Economic growth to human happiness. Okay? In this final bit, I want to move on to the story of value... And I want to introduce a concept called the integrative economy. And that, in turn, means doing some conceptualising, which us academics love doing. So we need to try and, firstly, conceptualise what it is we mean by the happiness lens. And this table here really represents just work in progress, which will hopefully, hopefully appear in a paper not before long. <clears throat> Now, I'm not going to bore you with the detail here because it's far too late. And I haven't really got time anyway. But I just want to flag up three things from this conceptual model. What, what would be the view, what would the view be through the happiness lens? And there are three main things. Firstly, it's about a shift in focus from finite supply to finite demand. So often the focus is actually on the supply of the Earth's resources because we're running out of them, which is obviously relevant and it's right. But I think that we can also show that it's possible for us to reduce demand, for us to stop treating everything on the face of the planet as something that's a commodity that we exchange with money. Surely we can do that, can't we? Secondly, it's about a shift from self-interest to personal and community interest. Now, conventional economics assumes that we make rational choices in the interest of ourselves. But this simply isn't true. Firstly, we're not rational. 
I mean, if you were rational, you wouldn't be sat in here this evening, would you? <laughs> Secondly, we're human beings. We have thoughts, feelings, which take us beyond the realm of self-interested economic behaviour. And actually, if you look at it, what's happening already across the community and the voluntary sector is an example of the power of this. And we've seen tonight just the effect of, of that kind of activity, the effect it can have on our happiness. And finally, it involves economics finally following psychology out of this behavioural paradigm. To treat happiness as something that actually drives our behaviour, that isn't simply just a byproduct of it. So for this, we need to focus on feelings, thoughts, and behaviour, obviously. But not just this narrow focus on utility-driven behaviour. Really, where is it getting us? OK. Now, I want you to use your imagination. I want you to imagine all the people living life <laughs> in an integrative economy. <laughs> now, I don't think John Lennon would have really liked that lyric. But he might actually like this idea. I call it integrative because the economy isn't seen in isolation from any other aspect of the human condition or of the ecosystem that we dwell in. Now, I haven't really got much time, but what I want you to do is imagine four things. The first thing I want you to imagine is negative interest rates. I know it sounds counterintuitive. No, it sounds completely bonkers, actually, Paul, but there we are. <clears throat> but bear with me. Imagine if you had £100, you put it in the bank, and a year later, it was worth 90 quid. But a guy in your local village said to you, OK, don't put it in the bank. For every £100 you invest in my new business startup, which is all about 3D printing, it's going to be the next big thing, every 100 quid, I'll give you £95 back. You'd consider it, wouldn't you? It would encourage you to be more adventurous with your money, to take some risks, to support the community. And, of course, the business would have a better chance of survival because it wouldn't be spending all its early years, which are the crucial years, just swimming against the tide of interest payments. Shall we try it out? Stephen. Would you be willing to lend me five pounds? Wallet as well. <laughs> you won't see this very often. That's where I'm going wrong. My money seems to come from my pocket. OK, thank you. Uh, now, Paul? that's very kind of you. Would you um, be willing to lend me this five pounds if next week I paid you back four pounds fifty? No. OK, what about if... You put this five pounds in the bank, but the bank would only give you four pounds back, 50p less than me. Would you be willing now? Then I would. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I can see a few of you there saying, oh, I've always wanted to borrow a fiver off the VC. <laughs> well, it's easy. OK, the next thing I want you to imagine is a world where all of us, whether we work or not, get a welfare check every single month to cover our basic necessities. After that, we're free to work or we're free not to work. More controversial than negative interest rates? Well, maybe. Now, that's all I'm going to say on that for now. I'm going to leave that to your imagination. The third thing I want you to imagine is a world where some goods and services are traded with money, but others are actually exchanged without the need for money at all. A return to the principles of the gift economy, which is actually where it all started for us many moons ago. If you pick up an economics textbook, look at the first page, it'll start rattling on about the barter system. But actually, the economic system of old wasn't based on barter at all. It was based on gifts. Now, there are two important distinctions between barter and the gift economy. With barter, you gave something and you expected something back. In the gift economy, you give something, but you expect nothing back. But here's the best bit. 
because you expect nothing back, you're going to get it back. And of course, these acts of generosity, if you think it through, would actually help build community. If you receive something from somebody in your community, you feel obligated to the, to the community. You feel committed to it. And actually, again, if you look at what's happening in the voluntary community sector, that's the sort of thing that is happening. Finally, I want you to imagine a currency that was backed by the Earth's resources and its capacity to absorb, to transform waste, instead of a currency which only has a value because people agree it does. Or more to the point, because people perceive it does. Think about it. Let's take this five pounds. Just borrow it off the VC. This five pounds has only got a value because all of us in this room agree that it does. Take that agreement away, the currency would collapse. But imagine if it had a value beyond simply that agreement or that perception. Imagine if it was based on real things that we value, like our planet or the well-being of our society. Now, I'd love to say more, but I don't have the time. You're going to have to watch this space for the paper that will hopefully follow this lecture. But, it, of course, it is important to point out that all these things are complementary. You're not going to have any one of those things without all of them. And, in fact, there are a whole load of other things you're going to need as well. So it's just the start of the thinking, really. Now, I do appreciate these ideas might sound a little bit left field. But, actually, there's nothing sustainable about mounting levels of private and public sector debt, rising levels of mental illness, or the social unrest which is bubbling away below the surface in some parts of Europe as their citizens just get more and more disillusioned with our government's addiction to economic growth. Now, these aren't my, just my ideas. They're already out there in the realm of contemporary thinking from writers like Anazeki, who I spoke about, Eisenstein across the pond, and El Diwani here in the UK. But they haven't yet entered the mainstream economic debate, or indeed the mainstream academic debate, yet. So my role really will be to help give them a conceptual frame, which initially I would see as facilitating some test beds of some of these ideas, mainly through exploratory and action research. So now we can complete our matrix. We move from perceived value to real value. And just as our currency would be backed by something real, we also need to start recognising more clearly what it is that we value and why. And I have a suggestion. Let's start with our time. So we make a shift from outputs to outcomes, from economic growth to human happiness, from perceived values to real values. To explore these things, I'm going to be using socioeconomics, which I see really as sitting at the interface of economics, sociology, psychology. But as part of that, let's get back to our roots and consider once more the economy being about stewardship. Let's try and understand and rebuild community. But perhaps more than anything, let's try and understand ourselves. We're all so busy running around trying to understand everything. Sometimes we forget the most important thing of all. And in thinking about research methods in under 30 seconds, I'd just like to end with this quote from Charles Eisenstein. Of all the things that human beings make and do for each other, it is the unquantifiable ones that contribute the most to human happiness. <clears throat> So, I think I'm done. I'd like to thank you for your patience, for your generosity, and for taking part this evening.